Okay. I'll start with the theorem. So the fundamental theorem of calculus part one. Suppose uh, we have a function, we call it f, is continuous on the closed interval from A to B. Okay. Uh, then we define the function, another function, G, um, in the following manner. So then G is defined, oops, defined by, and we'll write uh, G of X will be the integral from A to X of F of T dt, okay, where X is a value between inside the close the interval a b like so okay so we define the function g by letting the integral go from a to x and the comments that we have here we're going to say that g by itself is continuous on the same interval and differentiable, if you remember the definition of differentiability, in other words, the derivative exists. The difference between continuity and differentiability is the boundaries of the interval. We require continuity on the closed interval. In other words, we include the endpoints. Differentiability required only on the open interval. Uh, and this is because of the definition of the derivative. If you recall, the limit definition of the derivative required that the limit, the limit exists. If we approach from the left, approach from the right, we have the same value, right? So we have to include the endpoints to accomplish that. Um, mm, I'm contradicting myself. Yes, actually, I'm not contradicting myself. And uh, if that's why we, we don't include the endpoints, because the endpoints we don't have, we don't approach it from one side. For instance, A, we approach it only from the right, but we don't approach it from the left. While if we stay inside the interval without the endpoints, then we are fine. So we are differentiable any time uh, inside the interval A, B. Okay? <clears throat> but I didn't finish the statement. So G is continuous on the closed interval and differentiable on the open interval such that, and here comes the actual theorem. The, all of the, up, to, up to this point, it was a supposition. In other words, what is the requirement for uh, a function to satisfy the fundamental theorem of calculus part one? G prime... If G is defined as the integral, well, G prime will be the derivative of G, right? D prime will be D dx of G, and, but what is G? G is what I wrote here. So I'll put a bracket right here and I say, well, actually I don't need at this point. I'll just put the integral, the integral from A to X of F of T dt. And as such, we're going to say that it's equal to f of x. So, the derivative of the integral is f of x. Thing to notice at this point is that the, the integrand, the function inside the integral, has a variable of integration t. Now, remember, we can choose integration is an operation. So we have the integral of something in t, dt. I could have changed it to something in r, dr, or something in s, ds. The uh, choice of the variable of integration is random. We just, it's a name that we give for the operation. The result, however, is the function f of x. Notice that x is the variable, and the variable sits on top in other words, the variable is the upper boundary of the integral. Okay? Let's visualize this uh, theorem. 
what it does tell us, it tells us the following. If I have a function uh, that whose graph on, since I have t is the variable of integration, it will be y versus t, right? And let's say this is some random function, uh, y equal f of x, f of t, I'm sorry. So this is the integrand, the function inside the integral. And the boundaries will be a to b. So we go from a to b, and we know that on this uh, interval, the function is continuous on the closed interval. It means that we know that the integral is basically the area captured between the graph of the function and the positive half of the x-axis, right? Oh, the, I'm sorry, between uh, the graph of the function and the x-axis. So the integral will be the area underneath. So what does it mean, the boundary from A to X? We start at A, and here we have a variable X. And X is a moving target. X can move to the left toward A or to the right toward B, and actually can carry any value between A and B. The integral itself now becomes a function because it depends on the value of x. So it's a function depends on whose independent value is x. So g of x right here is the area inside or the area that I, um, the shaded area. That's a g of x. While f of t, the integrand is the curve itself. Okay. So this is what the uh, FTC ta uh, one tells us. If you look carefully at what we see here, and if you remember uh, the definition of the interval, I'm trying to remember N Newton's uh, uh, teacher or mentor uh, at uh, Trinity College uh, in Oxford, but he made the observation that really what you see here is... Uh, a demonstration that integration, which you see right here, and differentiation, which you see right here, are really universal operation. One undoes what the other does. Okay? Same as, you know, addition, subtraction, or something like that. Power and root, exponent, logarithm. Well, uh, of course, in the Newton, at Newton's time, Newton did not use this notation at all. Uh, Newton had some other stuff, flexion, and, and he called derivative, he didn't call them derivative, and he didn't have this particular uh, notation for the integral, he had some really bizarre notation for integrals. Um, so the language was different. Those notations that we're using now were created by Leibniz. Um, and of course, you, I don't know if you heard, but um, uh, in Calc 1, I, I told the story about the rivalry between Newton, Newton and Leibniz, and some of the of these rivalries carried over till today. Still, people are debating who really is the inventor or the father of calculus up to today. But as a whole, at least when it comes to notation, we're using Leibniz notation. Okay, so. Okay, so this is FTC 1. What about FTC 2? Well, that's a little bit easier concept. Uh, this is uh, FTC to allow us to actually perform calculations. Uh, let me switch pages here. So FTC 2, the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus Part 2, it really introduces the definite integral. Again, we have the supposition that f is, uh, is continuous on the closed interval, or on a closed interval uh, from A to B. Then we have the statement that the integral from A to B of f of x dx, now the variable of integration is x, and the integrand is f of x lowercase. And this, this is a value, and it turned out it will be 
the value of f uppercase evaluated from b to a. So it's the difference between the final value of f and the initial value of, of f, uppercase, where f is the antiderivative, f uppercase is the antiderivative of f lowercase. So that if we take the derivative of uppercase, uh, we get lowercase, if so. Okay? Now, we can write it in order to eliminate the need to use f lowercase, f uppercase, f uppercase, we can write the FTC2 in, in the following manner. Instead of using the integrand f lowercase, since I established the fact that uh, f uppercase prime is f lowercase, I'll simply write the integrand as f prime of x dx, and uh, the result is f of b minus f of a, and this is a more convenient form. So I'll go ahead and frame it. Actually, I forgot to frame this one. I mean, you can frame it if you want. You can hang it on the wall, like so, stick some nails here. It's important. Okay. Here we go. Now, a matter of notation. Uh, and again, most of you remember it from Calculus 1, but I'm just uh, generating a common uh, ground here. We're going to write the integral from a to b of f prime of x dx. Instead, we can write it as f of x, which is the antiderivative evaluated from a to b. Okay, so this is a little bit uh, sometimes a more convenient notation, and the way we interpret it is, is f of b minus f of a. Okay? Now, let's uh, write a couple of observations here. The difference between uh, FTC1 and FTC2. Um, one observation is that FTC1 produces a function. Okay, if you go back here uh, to FTC1, you see that the end result is f of x, not a value. On the other hand, FTC2 produces a value or a number. As you can see, this is a number. It's the value of f of b minus the value of f of a. The other observation is already uh, mentioned that, that FTC1 and FTC2, really, because if FTC2 you see that we have f prime and f. So FTC1 and FTC2 uh, express the derivative and the integral and the derivative as inverse operations. 